Hi, this is Matthew Robert Payne, and this is uh, a parable being explained. And as a prophet, uh, it's uh, quite within my purview, but quite within my ability for Jesus to speak through me. And we're doing a playlist of uh, Jesus' 54 parables. And if you just surfed in on YouTube and found this uh, parable because you searched under this uh, parable name, uh, we're going to present the meaning of this parable, but rather than me doing it, Jesus is going to bring it. So I'll just uh, hand it over to Jesus and we'll start this. And we're going to do the parable with Tulu here, asking questions about the parable, and Jesus is going to answer the parable. So I encourage you, if you enjoy this, subscribe to my channel and go and watch all the rest of the parables. God bless. So Jesus says, uh, hi, Tulu. Hello. Hello, Jesus. How are you today? I, I'm having a really good time uh, with uh, watching and replaying and watching the reactions of all the work you're doing with your videos. You're watching the reactions? Yeah, I, I've been watching, uh, you know, uh, how heaven responds uh, to... Mm -hmm. uh, to your teachings and not only the interviews with saints, but uh, heaven tunes in when you do these parables too. And I marvel too mm -hmm. that, that not necessarily in stadiums, but they watch these videos and the TVs at home. And uh, I, I, I go into uh, people's houses and watch their reactions, you know? Oh, that's beautiful. Cause, cause I, um, I, I've got the attributes of uh, God, all knowing, all powerful, and everywhere at once. Because people are in heaven, I don't have to be have permission to be standing behind them. And uh, so, if you're listening to this and you're in heaven, I'm always watching you. And um, yeah, so thank you, thank you, Jesus. It's good to know that you're always watching us. <laughs> So today, the Bible verses for the parable today is the great physician, and that's Matthew chapter 9, verse 10 to 13. So I'm going to read the Bible. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So that's the now end of sounds the like This sounds like a message for the religious church. Uh, and uh, I hope that you've uh, made some questions that allow me to bring out uh, like both an encouraging message and a harsh message. Um, so we'll see what your questions say and see what I have to say. But I, I'm sort of excited about uh, the message today. Thank you, Jesus. My first question is, the Pharisees question why you, Jesus, will hit with tax collectors and sinners. What message were you conveying through this association? Okay, so have you ever, have, listener, have, have you ever met a person who's just the most loving, giving, nice, genuine person who can have a great conversation with you can you can ask them for a loan of twenty dollars you can tell them that uh, you've got a problem with your wife or you're struggling with this and they'll listen to you and they'll ask you good questions and they they won't try and give you advice unless you ask for it uh, some people are just try and give you unwanted have you just unwanted advice and they're sort of controlling people but have you just met this like really genuine uh, person um, and, and it's just fun to hang around with and you mightn't see him uh, very often, but
but to just like to hang with them because they're just such a beautiful person. That's what tax collectors and sinners are like. That's just like the normal uh, sinner, like the, the normal drunk or the normal heroin addict or prostitute or uh, person having a hard time in life and who's suffered a lot has learned just to get by and do their best. They're generally really nice people uh, to talk to, engage, and they make really good friends. And um, a lot of people don't understand, uh, you know, the process of uh, how a rabbi taught, but a rabbi could teach uh, in public, not teach his students, uh, and and also and it teaches students, but at any time someone in the audience wanted to ask a question, part of uh, part of teaching in the Jewish way was allowing questions and answering questions. And if someone asked a question because they wanted to know, a rabbi could even make it a deeper question by responding, saying, "Why are you asking that?" and a lot of people will ask you questions to try and trip you up. They they want to say, so so you're saying you interview saints and dead people come down from heaven and 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 they talk through you and you mix with them. And if you say yes, then they're gonna say, Don't you know Deuteronomy such and such says you shouldn't do this? And are you aware by doing this? That, that you're practicing witchcraft and doing an abomination and no one should believe you because you're, you're a Christian and you're in the right mind, but you're doing something the Bible forbids. What have you got to say to that? If that person said that in a crowd of people where, where the saint was going to speak or you're going to minister, you've got a problem in your hands because a whole lot of people have gone into doubt and gone into fear, gone into worry. So when people ask questions, um, you you got to understand the motive of why they're asking the question. Because if they just want to use your answer to destroy you, you've got to have more information about why they want to know. So uh, people used to say to me why I responded with questions. Well, that was a natural rabbi thing. And that was the form of a teaching. And it's got an actual name of one of the famous philosophers talked about that form uh, of teaching. It's got a famous name, Socratic method. Um, and uh, so when I was teaching, it was hard work because I was always being questioned and argued with, and the Pharisees were stuck in their ways. And, you know, I don't blame them because it's been studied and passed down for 300 years and they thought they're right and, you know, nothing's changed and everything they know has been passed down and spoken about, so they're very religious. They're very sure of themselves, very confident, so they caused a lot of trouble and it was hard work preaching when they were around and asking questions because I spent so much time defending myself and um, you can imagine if someone asked you that question, made that statement in front of a whole lot of hungry people, you'd have to spend half an hour defending why that's okay before you got them back in the line. So the crux of the matter is my life was, preaching was hard because uh, mm -hmm. the Pharisees were always asking questions that caused trouble. So when I relaxed, I just wanted to be with that person that drinks beer, that sinner, the person who's suffered, who's a genuine person. And if you need $20, you can ask for them. They won't ask you why you need it. You know, so many of them have got addictions and they need $20 for the next shot of heroin. So if they've got a spare $20, they'll give it to you. They, they won't say no or judge you. If they've got it, they'll give to you. But most of them say, to be honest, I, I need $20 to pay my light bill. I've been drinking too much. and. The good thing about sinners uh, and people who, who are real bad people is they're very honest. They they don't hide. They don't wear faces. They don't put a pretense on. Their life is such a mess that, 
you know, they thought that uh, they might as well be honest. And so that's why I used to sit down with sinners and tax collectors, because I just want to sit down and have a good conversation. So if you're one of those people, Christians wouldn't be watching this, but um, uh, but that's the reason. And you, you, may, you may have wondered yourself why I, I used to just sit down and relax with sinners. And that's the reason. Thank you, Jesus. In response to the Pharisees, you mentioned that those who are well do not need a physician, but the sick do. How does this metaphorical language explain your purpose in interacting with tax collectors and sinners? That's a very good question, uh, Tulu. And um, it was a good analogy, like, uh, Matthew really hates doctors or doesn't like doctors. He's got a family doctor. He's just always visited medical centers and seen whatever doctor was on duty or whatever doctor was the next appointment. But he's finally got a medical center that he goes to that he sees a doctor and the doctors become a friend and the doctor's a Christian. And it's really good. But Matthew just hates doctors and he has to be really sick. He doesn't think doctors can do anything. And has to be really sick or have a real problem to go to the doctor and uh, to seek out a doctor. He just doesn't like it, but sometimes he has to go. Well, that's what the sick do. When when uh, they've got a problem, they seek out a physician. They, you know, they, they need the toothache to be fixed or they need the pain in the back to stop. And when they're sick and they know they're sick and they can't fix themselves, they'll seek out a doctor. And that's why the tax collectors used to pull up a seat and talk to me because I had so many answers to their struggles and pains and I could answer all the questions. And it's like them going to the doctor. They've got issues and they've got pain and they need solution. And I could say things that took their pain away and they had real physical spiritual and emotional needs and they saw me as a person who could fix them and uh in conversely the pharisees thought they had all the answers the pharisees thought they had all the solutions the pharisees thought they knew everything the pharisees were really prideful and self-righteous and the pharisees were very good at obeying the law and practicing everything the law said but they didn't understand the spirit of the law. Sometimes they judge people that weren't living right according to the law and they judge them and reject them. And part of the law was that you'd make yourself unclean if you sat down with a Gentile, with someone who who's not uh, a Jew. But you'd also, if you sat down with someone who was a sinner, you could put yourself in a position where you may not be unclean, Matthew's not sure, but um, you wouldn't be encouraged to uh, spend company or any precious time with someone who's just disregarding the law, like their sin will get on you. So the Pharisees were very holy people and separate people, and sometimes uh, unmercifully so, and they made it uh, very clear and evident that the sinners weren't welcome at their table for somehow they'd catch their sins. So um, I made a point of, of saying that uh, uh, analogy to try and uh, tell them that I'm not going to sit with you because you don't need any answers. I'm going to sit with the people that need the answers. Oh, wow. So Jesus, how does that relate to the modern day Christians today? <laughs> well, when a modern day Christian gets in a conversation with a broken hearted person or a person of the world or a sinner, um, very, very rarely, but religion tells them that they've got to share the gospel. And the modern day Christian's idea of sharing the gospel is trying to uh, tell a person that they're a sinner and if they don't accept Jesus and go to church and live the way Jesus taught, they're going to end up in hell. So the, the word gospel means good news and they think 
telling a person who's had a hard life, who likes a beer and likes to gamble on the races, I think sitting down and uh, befriending them and getting to a stage where they love them enough that they don't want them to go to hell, they think opening up and telling them that Adam, uh, Adam and Eve, uh, you know, went into a perfect garden and one day they were tempted and sin entered the world and God finally sent a solution to sin, which is Jesus Christ. And uh, if you're a sinner and you die in your sin, you're going to go to hell. So they share the gospel with their friend, the person who's taken them in and has had a few beers with them and gets comfortable with them. And their uh, gospel is full of judgment and condemnation and gives the person no option. Like, uh, they've got to say this sinner's prayer, repeat this sinner's prayer, and then start going to a church full of hypocrites uh, for them not to go to hell. And essentially, people in America and Australia are given a choice. You can join judgmental, critical, finger-pointing people and go to church with them and not enjoy yourself, or you can take a chance that your relationship with God is good enough uh, and you'll go to heaven. But the message that's given out by the traditional church in their professional standard of witnessing and sharing the gospel is, if you don't do what I say, you're going to spend an eternity in hell. And so the genuine good-hearted drug addicts and drinkers and gamblers and sinners who know they're sinners, those good-hearted people Jesus used to sit down with, they make a choice. They say, well, I, I think Jesus is my saviour. I think he died for my sins. And I don't think he'd really care if I went to church or not. I pray to him every night. And they'll tell you that. They'll, they'll say, I don't believe you've got to go to church to be right with God. I pray with him every night. And if you ask him honestly without judgment, we, you know, remember... You know when someone's asking you questions out of curiosity or they're asking you questions because they want to judge and make a decision on you, you, you can tell the attitude of the person sometimes. But if you honestly, with no judgment and, and, and no judging the person, you ask them, do they believe Jesus was the Son of God? Yes. Do you believe that he's, he's death died for your sins? Yes. Do you believe he died on the cross three days that later he resurrected and went to heaven? Yeah. Do, do you want to do Jesus' way and his teaching, or do you try and do Jesus' teaching and do his ways with your life? Yes. Well, according to Romans, some verse in Romans, Matthew thinks, that's a confession of faith and they're saved. Uh, and what many Christians are trying to save are always safe. They just need to shut their mouth. And if they want the person to grow in the Lord, they just can ask the person, do you mind if I bring a Bible and next time we have a beer, we do a Bible study and discuss the Bible? Sure. The person's got no problem with that, but they've got a problem coming to a church. And the problem with the church is the verses, the, the Bible's full of verses and um, churches ha have, have these certain ideas and teachings and what people call doctrines and the way they behave and the way they act and the way they're told to behave, the way they're told to act, they practice interpretations of scripture and every church in America has wrong interpretations of scripture. And they're, they're doing something religiously. They're, they're trying to obey the scripture, but their understanding of the scripture is wrong. And there's all sorts of factions and all sorts of arguments and uh, learning Christianity in the modern Christian church makes you a judgmental, critical uh, person who points the finger at people. And you may not mean to, you may be, a really good-hearted Christian, and it's a lot of really beautiful, good-hearted Christian, but you honestly believe, unless you convince a person to say a sinner's prayer, uh, unless they attend your church, which is not to forsake 
the gathering of the brethren. You honestly believe if a person isn't attending church that they're a backslider? You honestly believe unless they're born again through your one paragraph prayer that they'll go to hell? And the fact is that's not the truth. The fact is mm -hmm. a lot of people who've never said a sinner's prayer have better faith in God than you. And the fact is your misinterpretation of scripture and what a person needs to do and not do, you're wrong and they're right. And they don't need to go to the church and they've got better faith in you. And when they need things, they get miracles and they've seen miracles. And if you're honest and you've not got preconceived ideas that you need to save that person, if you get off your high horse and actually ask some genuine questions, you'll find that they've seen angels and their grandmother passed away and whenever they want to see their grandmother, she appears at the end of the bed. And if you're open to the supernatural and, and open to free discussion without judging people, you'll find that they talk to their relatives and their mother is always with them and uh, their mother's like a guide to them and uh, whenever they need something, it just manifests. And when they get desperate, they ask God and he provides prayer and they've always got finances. And when, whenever they're in trouble, there's a miracle happen. And so one time they needed food and someone knocked on the door and there was like a, a basket full of food. And, you know, they're living the same supernatural life to you. Uh, and uh, they've got all the evidence. If you bother to get off your high horse and, and ask him genuinely as a friend about these things. But uh, the modern church has made the modern Christians so judgmental and closed-minded, they can't accept that they're trying to save someone who's already saved. Thank you, Jesus. So I guess religion has damaged Christians more than helping them to be closer to you. And there's so many misconceptions which we believe is the right thing, but absolutely they are not right. They are they're wrong. They're judgmental. So through these interviews, I'm learning quite a lot to know that you don't need to go to church. doesn't represent your closeness to Jesus. It's a personal relationship. Church oh. does should help you. Yeah, I... I want to share with you a scripture that, uh, you know, when Christians meet you, they say, are you Christian? Yeah. What church do you go to? And so when I go to church, I go to the Salvation Army Church. And then they'll say, why do you say when you go to church? I said, I haven't been to church for three years. And, and, and they'll say, why is that? I said, well, COVID hit and our church uh, stopped and the church isn't going anymore. And so I haven't felt the need to go to church. Then they'll bring in their judgmental stuff and they'll say, but you need to go to church. And you ask them why. And they'll say, uh, you should not forsake the gathering of the brethren because that's the standard religious verse that says, unless you go into church, you're in a un un sinful state and a disobedient state. And they call it backslidden, right? Because that's one of the tenets of being a good Christian is attending church every Sunday. And they've got a misunderstanding of that verse and what that verse means. The context of that verse was first said in the early church and, and the Holy Spirit revealed this to Matthew, gave him all this revelation on this verse. So I'm going to share something, what that verse means. So you can get that religious verse out of your mindset. The, the, uh, the Church of Acts used to get up at 6, 5 and 6 in the morning. They'd go and work in their farms and work with their crops and stuff. About 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they used to knock off. And, and by 5 or 6 o'clock, they're at the temple. The whole church, could have been 200 members, used to go to the temple and worship at the temple meet God in the Jewish synagogue or in the temple that go to the synagogue and they corporately worship because our house churches, the only time they could get to uh, together in one body and worship together was, was in the synagogue. Well, the, the, 
the Christian faith was the cult. The, the mm. Christian uh, church was a sect. It was a break off of Judaism. But the Christians, the early Christians, practiced the law so well and perfectly lived in the Jewish faith that the Jews that have left and come into a new faith wouldn't reject them. They weren't unclean. They are welcome at the temple. That's like you being such a good Christian that you can go and worship in a, in a Muslim mosque. Because when the Muslims meet you, you're such a beautiful person that you're obeying everything they teach. So they welcome you there. So they're meeting at the temple corporately and they may be there from six to eight. And then eight o'clock they left and they broke off and went to homes. They used to meet at homes and have dinner and have fellowship around the table and laugh and joke and talk to the neighbour next. Then they break into chairs in a round circle and one would have a psalm, one would have a song, another person uh, would feel emotional and say, why don't we sing this song? And they sing songs uh, for half an hour or 40 minutes. Presence to the Lord used to drop, but the songs didn't have a worship leader arranging the songs every day. The individual Christians said, let's sing this and let's sing this. And depending on how that affected a certain person, a certain person had the freedom to say, let's sing this next. And the Holy Spirit used to move on people freely and people selecting the songs were carrying out the will of the Holy Spirit. And then someone, when they felt that they had a message, they woke up when they were doing that work that day, they impressed by the Holy Spirit, say this at church tonight. So they'd ask who's got a word and someone would bring the scriptures and bring a message, right? And then they'd break off and practice the gifts of prophecy and healing. If anyone had a need, people were healed, people were prophesied in, all the gifts of, of the Spirit were in activation. There was no leader, but there was an apostle over the church and and he leaded, but there was a house church leader that operated as the pastor and the church would break up and people who were hungry would stay around and maybe a couple of people in that church stayed up to 4 a.m. in the morning and were quiet and the owners of the house are in sleep. At 4 o'clock in the morning, they leave. They go home, have an hour's sleep and do the whole thing again. The church was always having finances People were always selling their houses. People were always giving. People in lack were always given that. No one was in lack. The church grew every day. There was new converts happening every day. The church met seven days a week and and uh, especially had a special day on the Sabbath on the day off. They, 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 instead of going to work on the Sabbath, they spent the whole day worshipping God. The the church was meeting seven days a week and, and was on fire and it was growing really fast. And it couldn't be stopped. And um, someone said, one of the apostles said, don't forsake the gathering of the brethren, right? Hmm. And he was saying, don't come out of this cycle. Don't stop meeting seven days a week. Don't stop this, right? So um, when it, when people quote the verse, you shall not forsake the gathering of the brethren, it, it doesn't mean don't stop going to church. It means don't stop this practice of revival and meeting seven days a week. Well, the only church in the world that meets every day is the Catholic church. They have a mass every day. They're the only ones that you call a cult or witchcraft or idol worshippers. They're the only ones obeying that command and being open every day. You can be a Catholic and go to church every day, but they don't spend all day there and, and they don't break off in the houses and have home fellowship. So the, the model of the early church stopped and the whole of the Christian church has stopped. And there probably isn't one church in the world that follows that model. So every Christian in the world has forsaken the gathering of brethren. So don't you ever accuse a person of that unless you're meeting people in, in a home church seven days a week, unless unless people are being added to your church every day and all your money's going on that, 
and and unless you're operating in the signs and wonders of the early church, stop your hypocrisy. Thank you, Jesus. That is so beautiful the way you explained it. That means we've misinterpreted a lot of Bible verses to please us, to work for us, but not necessarily interpreting it in the right way. So my next question is, you instructed the Pharisees to lend the many, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. What is the significance of this quote? And how does it relate to your mission and calling? So, uh, you know, um, you remember Samuel uh, said to Saul when he did the sacrifice in disobedience, uh, Samuel rebuked him and said to obey is better than sacrifice. So Samuel said that obedience is better than doing a sacrifice or doing something religiously, even something God has called you to do. Uh, obeying is paramount. And here Jesus was saying mercy is better than sacrifice. Um, the problem with the Christian church, the problem with religion and religious Christians is they don't feel they're worthy to go to heaven. They don't feel good. They don't feel accepted. The majority or large portion of Christians don't feel that they're lovable. They feel that they're such a sinner. They walk in such guilt and condemnation and got such low self-esteem that they take on the spirit of religion and legalistic thinking and they do a whole lot of religious duties to make themselves feel worthy. So they serve at a food kitchen uh, or, or they give their money uh, to the church or they go out witnessing on the streets, abusing people, telling people that they're going to hell and threatening people, think they're preaching the gospel. And those guys, Matthew tries to encourage those guys and he ends up in arguments because they're trying to convert him. They're trying to get another notch in their belt. They're very, the, the pe people who preach on the streets are, are very zealous and passionate, but they're doing it from religion. They're, they're doing it as a sacrifice. They're doing it to make them feel good. They're doing it for selfish reasons. Matthew witnesses and has uh, more effect than any of those street preachers on people. And um, so you find that the fundamental core reasons why people sacrifice and do things is selfishness. And for their own lack of self-esteem, they're doing religious things that earn their way to God. It, people are really, you know, grace preachers and hyper grace preachers are really quick to say we're saved by grace, but not by works. And then they do a whole lot of works of religion. They go to church, they sing songs for 40 minutes. Have, have you ever been to a church and you've been worshipping for 40 minutes and the pastor comes to the stage and says, I, I just feel that God wants to do some healing and minister to a lot of people. We're just going to worship today. We're not going to have a message. We're not going to have announcements. We're going to worship. And if, if you need prayer, come forward silently and we'll pray for you and minister for people. But... I just feel that the Lord wants to do a work in people's hearts today. We're just going to worship. We're, we're not going to have a sermon. Well, so many people would get angry with that because they're religious and they want to learn and they want to hear the sermon. They want to build their thing. And, um, you know, I had a church do that once and I got really upset because I was really religious. And I, I, I used to endure the worship. So, you know, I could listen to what's happening in the church in the announcements, and then I could hear the sermon. I was so angry. And um, I went, I, I, I've been, Matthew's been so religious. So when I said I, it was Matthew. Um, and uh, Matthew went to a Heidi Baker uh, meeting, and, and the people that invited her that was hosting it and making all the money out of it and hiring a building and charging all this money, uh, you know, that's why they put on guest speakers, not for the people, but to make money. They worshipped for an hour and three quarters, and Matthew was living mad, you know. They were singing about Jesus, 
Jesus, I wish you're here when I meet you. And Jesus was standing behind them with with his arms crossed, with, with a look on his face, like when are you going to finish worshipping me and get on with the message? Jesus was agreeing that their religious, their religion, their religiousness of getting in the presence was was annoying Matthew, and Matthew was getting annoyed. That's the only time he's ever heard Heidi Baker speak, and he was really touched, uh, you know, um, uh, by Heidi Baker, and she called uh, forward everyone who had mental illness, and he said she said she's going to pray for them. And she preached the message. Matthew was sitting on the stage at that stage, and um, she she felt led to pray for people with mental illness, and not many people came forward because they didn't want to admit, but. There's a few of us desperate people there and sitting on this, Matthew is sitting on the stage and she said, who, who here has ever seen an angel? And Matthew was waiting and she didn't say anything and he put his hand up and she addressed him. She said, you seen an angel? I said, yeah, of course I am. I'm schizophrenic. I can see everything. And like she laughed and the people were really shocked and, and she said, Matthew, you don't have to be uh, schizophrenic to see angels. It's quite okay to be able to see angels. And I'm happy you've seen an angel. So that was recorded. And that's on the video. If Matthew bought the video, that's in, like, Matthew become the star of the thing. No one in that building had seen an angel, right? They're worshiping for an hour and three quarters. And not, there's supposed to be a supernatural church on top of things. They had a big reputation in Sydney, and none of them had seen an angel. And Matthew only got on the stage to answer that question because he admitted he was schizophrenic or bipolar, schizoaffective, schizophrenic and bipolar. So he went forward as a crazy man. She, she made an altar call that would make you feel embarrassed. He went forward and he became the star of the meeting. And she knew he, what, who he was because she'd seen a video of him doing a prophecy. So she knew his name. And, and um, But uh, what I'm saying is people like to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. People like to do hard things. But it's religion. They're doing mm -hmm. it for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. it, you're giving money to the poor because it makes you feel good. You get like a certain rush out of doing good works. And there's, you know, uh, Matthew heard a teacher uh, that he forgets the name um, of right now. He said the, the, the works of the flesh are easy to overcome. If you walk in the spirit, you can overcome the works of the flesh. He said the hard works to overcome it's the good works of the flesh to get out of doing good things to make yourself feel good. And most religion, most good works being done in the church, a very high percentage of good works being done by the church are good works of the flesh, people doing things to make themselves feel good. When, when a ministry talks about supporting them, that they make a big list of the things they're doing, that 4,000 uh, widows in Africa and a church in such and such, and at least all the good works that they're doing, religious things, sacrifice, it all takes sacrifice. Um, but Jesus say, you, you talk to a broken-hearted prostitute on the street, give her some money, take her for a coffee, and say, if you ever hear, see me walking through these streets, my office is here. If you ever need a talk, take me aside. If you ever need money, say, in fact, here's my card. If you're ever desperate, give me a phone call, right? That she could stand around listening to an evangelist for years, uh, just using that as a church and listening to a message and fellowship. But that interaction will get her off the streets. And one day she'll call you and say, I need to really leave this life. Can you help me? Right, that one act of mercy with no judgment is a whole lot better than all the religious churches and all the good works that the religious churches do. I hate religion. I hate it. And most Christians have got so many different wrong interpretations of Scripture, just like the wrong 
uh, interpretation of don't forsake the gathering of the brethren. And they're so uh, distant from me and they so have no knowledge of me that they're constantly doing religious things and judging people and they don't have mercy. And I keep on telling people who are sinners, who've got hard lives, I keep on telling them, stop doing that. You need to stop doing that. You won't go to heaven. And they're judging them and, and they're being unkind with them, and they're being rude to them and they're being selfish to them and all the bad things. They're gossiping about them. They're envying them. They're just spending slander about them. They're, they're not forgiving them. Uh, but but they're not having mercy on them. Having mercy is listening. Having mercy mm -hmm. is being a person that gives them money when you know that it's going to go up their arm. Building a relationship with a person, getting a person into a place where they'll trust you to talk and trust you to take a risk and leave the streets and leave their addiction. Oh, that's beautiful, Jesus. We need to unlearn a lot of things that we've been taught growing up, especially the good works of the flesh. How can we avoid falling into this trap of the good works of flesh? Or how can we stop doing things that can be categorized as good works of flesh? Well, you got to, uh, Matthew's got a book called uh, Your Identity in Christ. Uh, many people who are busy being religious don't have a proper identity, right? Mm. If if you read your identity in Christ, it lists a uh, nineteen different ways that God sees you, and most people don't see themselves. Uh, when when Matthew was writing your identity in Christ, he he saw a Facebook post and says these are your identity in Christ, and it lists nineteen things. Then it had all the scripture references. And Matthew said, that'll be a good book. So he copied that person's thing and made a book out of it. But when he was writing the book, there's verse after verse that was saying he was perfect, he was blameless, he was set free, he was holy. The verse says that about you. The Bible says mm -hmm. that about you. And he was arguing as he's expanding it, he was arguing with the verses in, in, inside himself. Saying, you obviously don't know I sleep with prostitutes. You you obviously don't know I masturbate to porn every second night. You know, how can I be perfect? He was arguing, even in the text, even in what he was writing, you could see he was having an internal struggle with what the Bible said. But the Bible is either truth or it isn't truth. It It's either real or it isn't real. And... If, if you get those verses into you and you really meditate on that verses, when when you 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 realize that you're the righteousness of Christ despite what you do, when you really meditate on that and and meditate on the fact that you're holy and set apart for good things and you're perfect, you, you meditate on those some of those verses, the need to do things to make Jesus happy totally dissipates. You come to accept that you're perfect, you're righteous, and you're great, and you're accepted, and you're beloved, and you're his favorite, and you're a unique person, and you're from another area, and you're peculiar, and you're this. And the Bible says so many lovely things about what you are, but you don't believe those things. They're in the Bible, but you reject them. You're not holy. You're not perfect. You're not righteous. God doesn't know that I'm such a sinner. But the Bible says you are. You mm. know, the Bible says you are. And man's teaching, you know, this people teaching stuff, using scriptures in the Bible to speak again what, what the Bible actually says. And people have been indoctrinated with, the fact that you've got to do all these things and you've got to be without sin. Jesus' favourite people were sinners. Sinners are just the most nicest people. Right? Matthew wishes he could go to a club full of prostitutes where, where they drink and, and then he'd forever never have to sleep with a prostitute because uh, he'd just be able to mix with them for free. Um, 
Yeah, but a good place to uh, really engage with some beautiful women is to go to a strip club, but you can't really go to a strip club if you've got a problem with lust because there's all these naked women walking around. But Matthew used to go to a strip club and he, he didn't have a problem with lust and all the strippers were good friends of his and he used to minister to them and it was a wonderful time. But um, you, 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 you're so blinded. The Christian church is so blinded by religion and there's, they, they're so unknowing of their righteousness and their identity in Christ and they don't understand these scriptures that say they're perfect and the righteous and and scripture that says you you know Christ loved us so much that whilst we're still sinners he died for us you know it doesn't sound like Jesus died for you a sinner does it sound like that you can sin your way all all the way into heaven heaven people don't believe that a porn addict can go to heaven they believe he's got to stop right and they tell him he's got to stop. Well, some of them can't stop. They've got so much pain that they can't stop. So the Christian rejects them. And, uh, you know, um, and the fact of the matter is I watch and I know statistics and I know surveys and 70% of you men watching have got a porn problem. So how do you deal with that? Right, a lot of you do a whole lot of good works of the flesh to appease that and make yourself feel better. A lot, a lot of, a lot of you big sinners are very judgmental and self righteous and prideful, because that's what happens when you're beaten down by sin and you feel inadequate. So the way to conquer this religion and this wrong thinking is to buy Matthew's book, Your Identity in Christ. And read it a hundred times until you believe it. Thank you, Jesus. What do you think the Pharisees misunderstood by your actions and teachings when they question your association with tax collectors and sinners? That they couldn't understand it because their law and Matthew hasn't haven't read the Bible much and don't understand their law really well. Uh, but uh, Part of what they were taught, whether it's in the Bible or what they practiced as Pharisees, is that they would make themselves unclean or a sinner sitting with a sinner. Yeah, mm -hmm. like a Jew wasn't allowed to sit down with a Gentile. You, you remember, you remember Paul rebuked Peter because he used to sit with the Gentiles uh, at a certain time. When the Jews came in, he wouldn't sit with the Gentiles anymore, and Paul rebuked his double standards. That was based on some, some scripture or some Pharisaical sort of practice that Jew, like as as a Jew, shouldn't sit with Gentiles. And Peter was afraid of being judged by the Jews, so he wasn't being loving to the Gentiles. And the law had been broken in Christ, and grace has uh, saved it and post christ there should be no separation and um jews weren't allowed to sit with gentiles but after the cross they were um, but the pharisees believed that the gentile or the sinner's sin could get on them so to remain holy and and set apart they just didn't sit with sinners and so it was against their religion it was against their custom and jesus as a good rabbi should be doing what they do and they took offense and they were offended at jesus because they wanted jesus to sit with them and answer their questions and be their friend and jesus was sitting with this whole lot of unclean sinners who, who got no intention of obeying the law and these people are you know, it's like it's like Matthew being invited to do a conference and all all the pastors who put on the conference like fifty churches, they paid him a hundred thousand dollars and here's just this big keynote speaker and he comes to your church and 
when when uh, when he comes to the conference, when it's dinner time, uh, the pastors want to go out to a restaurant that they've booked uh, to meet with the guest speaker and get personal with him. It's like Matthew meeting a prostitute, a known prostitute or a known stripper or someone who's a really vile sinner, and Matthew making excuses and says, I'm going to dinner with her. Like, they would be so offended. Like, what's he doing with her? Doesn't he know who she is? And they'd even tell him, she's the madam of the biggest prostitute den in here. There's so many, she's the cause of so much sin. I don't know what she's doing here, but we've booked this, you need to come with us. Matthew said, no, I think she needs to hear. I think she's got a question and she's approached me and she's got a lot of questions. It's going to take me over an hour to answer. So if you please, I'd like to excuse myself. I'd like to be excused. I'd like to go home with her. Well, you'd never hear the end of it. You'd hear videos. You'd hear speeches. You'd hear articles. There'd be blog posts. Matthew's name would be trashed because he wasted their time. And the problem with uh, religious Christians and people who are being holy and dotting all the I's and who think they're perfect, the problem with them is they become so self-righteous and prideful about how good they are that they've got no mercy for people that need help. And they were really offended with me that I was mixing with the low lives. Thank you, Jesus. So what should be our response to people around us today that will behave like the Pharisees? Just just uh, give them Matthew's book, Your Identity in Christ, saying, I, I uh, bought this book for you. I think it would be really helpful for you. Uh, I hope that you're not offended me buying a book. It did a lot of work uh, uh, for me, and I was very much... Uh, thinking like you and I've heard you speak and we've interacted a couple of times and the Holy Spirit put on my heart to get you this book. I think you'd uh, really enjoy this book. Don't be offended at me giving you a book and I'd really love to catch up over a meal and discuss uh, the key uh, things that you got from this book. Have a good day and let Matthew's book do the walk, do the talk. Thank you, Jesus. By associating with tax collectors and sinners, what message were you sending about the inclusivity of your ministry and the availability of redemption to all? Well, the problem, the problem with people who think they're right and self-righteous and think they're holy and in many respects doing no sin and being really righteous and holy the problem with them is they're so full of themselves, they're so happy with themselves that they can't see any error, they can't see any fault in themselves. Remember the woman caught in adultery, I bent down on the ground and I wrote in the dirt. Well, a lot of people want to wonder what was written in the dirt. I'll tell you what I wrote. I wrote lust, adultery, covetousness. Right, I picked three sins that were big ones, and as I named the sins that people had, it convicted mm -hmm. them, and they walked away. Well, there are a whole lot of righteous, holy, law-abiding men that were trying to make me do something and make a judgment based on their law. They were a whole lot of self-righteous men. And all they had to do was write sins down to convict them. And they walked away like cowards. They didn't put up a defense and say, but, 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 the law says this. They, they didn't have like a conference with me. They walked away. And if, if you go through the lust of the flesh and do a sermon on what those all are, hardly anyone in an audience could sustain it. But the problem with 
religious folk and leaders in churches and experts in Christianity is they don't think they've got they're doing anything wrong and they're so full of judgment and pointing the fingers that the the Pharisees were obstinate. I, I spent years and years preaching and sharing good revelation and all they had was arguments for me and questions trying to catch me saying something that they could disagree with or discredit me. And um, I, part of the reason I kept on sitting down with the sinners was to try and provoke them into an argument and provoke them into a discussion where I could share truth with them. And, you know, I, I, I said, consider this, try and consider I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And that was my word for them. But if they didn't take away that and ponder that and learn from that, that's all I had for them. And, you know, Matthew finds it with, unless you're really close to Matthew and you're a really close friend and you've invested a lot of time into Matthew, he won't discuss the book of Revelation. So many Christians meet Matthew and they ask, him a question out of the book of Revelation and he tells them, I only talk about that with close friends and they become obstinate that he won't answer the question. And yeah, that's what happens. People who think they know a lot about the book of Revelation are obstinate and it's no use talking to them. We're just so full of pride thinking they know what they know. And it's very hard to convict or, bring a message to a prideful person and religious people are just prideful people. And Matthew went to listen to something to fill in some time. And it was, it was a podcast of, of like a video channel that one of uh, Matthew's favorite like, people he subscribed to, uh, the guy who was running is a very nice guy, but he was interviewing a whole lot of Christians uh, and he had a, theme of a few subjects and they ought to talk about those subjects. And one guy just went on and on and on and on and on and went for 20 minutes, kept on apologizing for talking too much, but then kept on talking too much, like I'm talking so much here. And um, he, he showed his lack of leadership by hogging all the time. And um, lack of, he, he, he had a good message and he brought a good message, but he had a lot of pride to taking other people's time, like to hear himself speak. And it went around the table and some people spoke for five minutes, but the messages were full of religion, full of false teaching. And it really, Matthew couldn't watch the end of the video. It was just upsetting him. And Matthew doesn't have many Christian friends because so many times they say things that just upset Matthew and Matthew rarely brings correction to people because it's really hard to bring correction to people when they think they're right. And the church thinks they're right. I think, you know, so many people see visions and they say Jesus is coming back in five years. And you could say to the person and all the followers that these five things have to happen before Jesus. And, you know, it's at least 20 or 30 or 40 years away. And they don't want to hear it because they're right. They've seen a vision, they've seen a dream. And you could try and tell them, but they haven't got ears to hear and religious people haven't got ears. And that's why a lot of people don't watch Matthew's videos because they say things that object. So I used to love hanging out with, uh, with broken-hearted people because they didn't have arguments. I didn't say things and people enter into arguments and try and say I was wrong. They were sick. They had hard lives. They wanted answers and they wanted help. And they were hungry to hear everything I had to say. But the people who thought they were living right, and uh, most Pharisees were like Benny Hinn's and Joyce Myers. They were at the top of the game. They, they weren't sinners. They, they were very religious and very pious and uh, very good people, it's just they knew they were and they're, they're happy and they're proud of the fact of how good they are. Yet, 
have you ever met have you ever met a really prideful person to mm, yeah can you talk to them can can you give them an idea or give them something different to what they're saying yeah. and they just won't listen I'll shut you down I'll tell you how you're wrong so how do you ever appeal to them how do you ever change them you just leave them you just leave them well so mercy even even I had to have mercy on the Pharisees even I had to love them even when they become an enemy I had to appeal to them because it was just their ignorance you know mm. the Christian church is ignorant and blind but ignorance isn't so much not knowing something it's thinking you know something and thinking you're an expert but you being wrong you're ignorant right uh and you know if if people listen to the heavens theories uh the interviews with saints and the 55 60 videos on that they'd find that christian church is very ignorant about heaven and what heaven's like and what heaven isn't like and they're happy they're blissful in their ignorance they think they they can be a hypocrite on earth and uh, be very disobedient on earth very lazy on earth and never receive their potential and never really do anything for God and whatever they do for God be good works of the flesh that makes them feel happy and makes them feel religious and makes them feel righteous. I think they're going to go to heaven and have this blissful time and have a wonderful time and they're going to be really shocked that everything they did on earth was wood, hay and stubble and they're going to be like a beggar in heaven, like the lowest caste, like Indian has multiple castes, and if if you're a beggar, it just means you've done something wrong in your past life, and no one will help you because that the basically the Indian culture basically said you're an evil person. So the Christians go into India and they feed the poor people and stuff, and they they win a lot of converts because the people realise that these people are loving. I believe in their gods, right? So Indians got 700 million gods and taking on one more God isn't a lot for them. So Christians without power and without anointing and most Christian churches, 80% of the Christian churches, no power, no Holy Spirit, they go in and win converts. But this famous apostle that talked to Matthew said the Brahmin caste, the top caste, like the seventh, the highest caste, they're... They're descended from Jews and they're geniuses and they're smart and they're millionaires. You're going to have to do something to impress them because he said, "My, I'm from the Brahmin caste and and I, I was trained to be uh, a priest and, you know, we have power. We have real power. He said, my dad used to walk down the street on a sunny day and he'd have a towel levitate above his head. He didn't have an umbrella, but he had an umbrella and a towel. He'd just be walking down the street and one foot above his head was a towel. And everyone would stare at him and they know he's full of power. And he's a powerful person. He said, if you don't come there with signs and wonders and power and the Holy Spirit, they won't listen to you. You can win the poor, but you won't win the smart and the wealthy. You won't win the big cars. You Christians are hypocrites. You Christians are, are full of religion and you Christians are rejecting the Holy Spirit and you're ignorant and you're wrong and you're not power. You're not powerful in a poor country. And that's why you don't make many converts as missionaries because you don't believe the word of God when it says this power came upon them and they spoke in tongues and moved in power. So you need a serious rebuke because you're so hopeless. And he said that to like 20 uh, Christian, 20 Baptists, and they all wanted to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you've got to be harsh with them. And I used my preaching most of the time and my illustrations to rebuke them. One time they complained. I know this is getting along, but one time they complained with me sitting with the sinners 
and I told three parables. I told the parable of of the lost coin, of the lost sheep first. And I said there was 99 sheep. He left the 99 to save the lost sheep. And and uh, and there was more uh, celebration in heaven for that lost sheep than the 99. To, to the sinners that were sitting at a table listening, they were getting identified, like to the sinners I was identifying as you're like this lost sheep and you're precious. And if you come into the kingdom, there's going to be a big party. That was like a beautiful message to them. To the Pharisees, I was saying, you're the 99 sheep that I'll leave to seek out the sinners. And you're already righteous and you're already protected. And I celebrate more over this one sinner than the whole 99 of you being here. Then I went on to the lost coin and she lost one coin. She had this big celebration. To the sinners, they're hearing, hey, if you come to come to me and follow my ways, there's going to be a great celebration. To the Pharisees, it was like this, this coin was so precious, she tore up her house looking for it. She had a big party. The party she had with her friends and stuff cost more than the coin. Like... Jesus is lavish with his celebrations. That like I, God is lavish with his celebrations. Then he told the thing of the parable of the prodigal son, and uh, this guy became someone who who uh, slept with prostitutes and drank the money and partied away. And if you rejected your father in those days, if you are rude to your father, the law says you should be stoned. That son, what he did, should have been stoned. The reason why the father was looking out every day and saw his son from a distance is if he didn't get to his son, the neighbours would have stoned that son. Well, the the Jews, the, the Jews thought that was highly offensive that the father would would forgive and embrace that son because you know the law said to stone him, so that was very convicting for him. But when, when he talked about the older brother who said all these judgments on the prodigal son, they were seeing themselves in that. They could hear me talking to them. You think you're so righteous. You think you're, I've been working hard all day. You've never given me a feast. And I was speaking to them and saying, you're like this older brother. Then the older brother didn't want to come into the feast. And, and he didn't come into the feast. And it's... And, and I was saying to them, you're not coming to my father's house. You're not coming to the feast. So on one hand, I was giving encouragement to all the sinners who felt like the prodigal. When when the older brother said he was sleeping with whores and drinking parties, the, uh, when I was sharing that parable, all the sinners were getting so happy. He says, yo, he understands us. It's a good story that I'm accepted by God because, you know, I can't save myself, but all the sinners who think their good works are saving themselves, uh, that they're identified as the older brother that doesn't enter in. And uh, so when I wanted to let my hair down, I used to spend time with sinners. And I, I encourage you, if you're watching this video still, go and spend some time with drinkers in pubs and get around gambling people and go, go into a gambling institution and make friends and start betting on horses and go and become a sinner and be one with them. And uh, when when Paul said I was all all things to all people so that I might win some, do you think he went out sinning or did he go out hanging out with the sinners and behave like them? And uh, that's something that's a mystery for you to consider. Um, but, um, yeah, so when I wanted fun, I used to... Uh, hang out with sinners, and that convicted them and really annoyed them. And if if you can do something to annoy people, uh, it gets them thinking. And then it gave me the opportunity to say, consider this, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And that, you know, questions, sometimes it's better not to give the answer, but just leave a riddle. Some people really love riddles. Matthew's brother really loved riddles. And he spent hours trying to work them out. Well, sometimes I've spoken riddles and 
My parables have been riddles. People have wondered what they are for centuries. Thank you, Jesus. And how does this translate to heaven in terms of your relationship with people that have been rejected when they were unheard or they've been counted as sinners or not worthy of being in heaven and they find themselves in heaven? Do you still relate with them like you relate with sinners when you were yeah, on earth? Some of, some of the biggest sinners occupy some of the most elevated places in heaven because those good-hearted people would do good for anyone, and whenever there was a need, they always did it. They're always doing the works of the Lord. They're always full of agape love. They're always walking in. So many sinners, so you know, a drinker or someone with a drug addiction or something, if you look at their life, their personal life, mm -hmm. they're, they're almost obeying all of my 50 commands. They're, they're so loving. They don't know what my 50 commands are, but people cross them and they forgive them. And, uh, you know, sometimes I get the idea, you know, I'll buy him a hamburger and maybe he'll stop arguing with me. They they don't know, bless your enemies, but they, they instinctively feel, I'll just do something good for them. And you talk to sinners and they talk about every time someone treats them bad, they just do that person a favour. It seems to work. And you find that they understand all the wisdom of of the commands and the parables without ever being taught that. Because you've got the same Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't have to have permission to minister to a person. It's the spirit of wisdom. So whenever I want to bring wisdom into a person, the Holy Spirit or an angel just speaks to the person. So you'll find when you get in heaven... You know, the local prostitute or, or the homeless person is lecturing you and he's doing the lectures in heaven on theology and he knows so much more. And it's the, the church is just so uh, annoying because they're just so blind and so ignorant. And I could name names. If I had a list of, if Matthew had a list of, of the most famous speakers in the world, he could name off all the false teachers as teaching error. You'd be really shocked. But you're so obstinate if you're one of these religious people. You're so obstinate and full of yourself and prideful that even if he listed off the names, that would be just one more reason why you'd go off and write to your friends and say, stay away from Matthew. Mm. Thank you. My last question is, how did your choice to share a meal with tax collectors and sinners serve as a teaching moment? And what broader lessons were you impacting through this action? Okay, so it's very hard to teach. It's very hard to teach people who know it all. Mm. Right, so... Let me answer that question. Me sitting with the sinners, letting my head down and fellowshipping with sinners wasn't trying to teach the the Pharisees anything. Mm. That would so wear me out and so annoy me. It was such hard ground. Have you heard of have you heard of a preaching and going into hard ground? Do you know what that means? You mean in the Bible? Part of the parables. Yeah. Like, it, it's just an expression in Matthew. Like, I, I, Matthew wanted to know if you know. Like, there's certain groups of people that, that are fertile soil. And when you go in there, the people are so desperate, so hungry. You, you can preach the word and nearly everyone accepts it. But there's certain regions and groups of people or churches you can go into, and you can preach the same word and no one responds. Like one person in a hundred responds and gets engaged. That's called hard ground. you still got to bring the message, but it's really hard to do it. Well, the Pharisees were hard ground. They're obstinate. And sometimes I just wanted to relax and have fun and enjoy myself and answer genuine questions, questions that a person will listen for an hour, like, 
If you're listening to this video, you really want to know what this parable is. If you're still listening, you're a really beautiful person, and I hope you're really blessed. But Matthew had a friend who, who went to a foreign country. He used to pay his expenses, and he doesn't charge a, a speaking fee. So he, he doesn't go there and charge him $5,000 and pay the hotel. He funds everything himself and takes up a collection wherever he goes and hopes that that meets the uh, expenses. But if he doesn't, he pays the difference. And he doesn't accept a speaking invitation unless he can pay everything up front. So he just relies on the Lord that the offering will bless him and he'll get his money back. And he was in this country, he'd flown to this country because he had an invitation. He'd been speaking for an hour and no one was engaged. No one was hmm. listening. They were obstinate. They were really angry at the message. He could tell in his spirit no one was receiving it. He was wasting his time. And in the middle of his sermon, he said to me, why am I even here, Jesus? Hmm. And he said, and I said to him, see the guy in the blue shirt up the back corner with the baseball cap. Make sure you speak to him after service. You came here for him. He'll never forget this. So he poured into it. Uh, but it was annoying him so much he had to ask me because it was turning him off to preaching. Like He was losing his anointing and grace to preach because these people were just shaking their heads and not receiving it. Well, that's what it was like preaching to the Pharisees. So I didn't sit down with sinners to teach the Pharisees anything. I, I sat down as an example for them, but they'd never take my example because their rules and religion wouldn't let them. And uh, but, uh, but I used to teach them uh, or try and teach them and appeal to them when I spoke to the crowd. Thank you, Jesus. That is my last question. I don't know if you've got any other message for people listening in heaven, but that's my last question. Yeah, well, thank you, Tolu. You asked some really uh, good questions. Um, hopefully, uh, when uh, you uh, consider this uh, parable and you've listened to it and maybe you listen to it again, perhaps what you can do is decide to um, start to go to clubs and pubs and hotels and start to learn to have a beer or some alcohol, meet strangers in pubs and start a conversation with someone who's drinking alone at the bar and how are you today? How, what brings you in here? Do, how many beers do you drink a day? And just ask some questions. Go into the places where the sinners hang out and just become a friend to them and uh, perhaps you'll win a good friend. Perhaps you'll do a real good job. And uh, and so I hope you enjoyed this. If you like this, uh, please uh, press like. If you have a comment to say, I'd be, Matthew would be interested in your comment. Uh, if, if you wanna continue this parable series, there's a playlist on Matthew's homepage. And if you enjoyed this, uh, preach, uh, consider subscribing to his channel.